people behind, Oscar Romero is new, have given their lives, have given their lives for a purpose. They were ultimately able to forgive. And that's what we need to tell you. You have the same tool in your tool bag. You have to be able to let go of the anger and the bad dirt that's been done you. You will also be able to pick up a copy of the book, Why Forgive, it's free in the bag, with 51 stories of people who've done that, including our speakers here today. And they're simple stories, but they're stories that are powerful because the individual was able to go beyond it themselves. It's ironic, and I'm telling you here, black and Latino audience, it's ironic that we've just come through a celebration called Thanksgiving in America, where we celebrate, we celebrate that Native Americans welcome these white Europeans into this country. And it's ironic that so many hundred years later, we do not welcome people at our borders. So we have to find some way as a nation to do this to each other, to our neighbors nationally, but above all to ourselves. Because we have to be able to forgive ourselves for the bad things we have done. And that's what we hear for today, are uh, too effective to kill it than another bullet. And he was a policeman. So it doesn't matter where you are in America. It makes no difference who is black, white, rich or poor. We all have this issue to face. So without further ado, we have here Coach Patrick Deliso, who's going to tell you his story. A remarkable story. Give him a hand. Thank you. He lost his 16 year old son to suicide throughout the court. He now shares his story to give hope to others. Thank you. Good morning, Eastside High School. 14 years ago, that was my son Patrick. He took his life when he was 16. So if you think it's easy for me to come here and talk to you and look at 16, 17, you're like looking at my son again. And I'm here. It took me 14 years to get the courage to come and talk to kids about it. See, I sent my wife, I was afraid. And my wife did it for years and years. And unfortunately, a couple of months ago, talking to a group of students, she had a heart attack. She's okay, but she looked at me and she said, who's gonna tell this story? I didn't wanna do it, but I had no choice. So I'm here today because I respect what BTC is doing, and I don't want anything to ever happen again to any parent, any friend, any kid that has happened to my family. And this is my story. Pat's mom and I were next door neighbors. She was my first girlfriend in the second grade. I would steal jewelry from my mom to impress her and give it to her on holidays and stuff. And I figured one Valentine's Day, let me do something special. And again, I'm only seven or eight years old. So I buy her a box of Valentine candy, I put a card in it, and I said, period. Pat took them, threw them over the table, and the fight ensued in the cafeteria, and my phone rang in my room, and it said, Coach, please come down to the office. We've got Patrick in here. So I knew that wasn't good. I walked in, he was covered in orange, much like your, your shirts are right now, and they told me what happened. They suspended him out of school for seven school days. We were walking out the front door where his mom was picking him up. He said, Dad, are you mad at me? I said, absolutely not. I said, you stood up for people. And I said, that's important. But you got in the fight and you have to take your punishment. And that's okay. A few years later, I was coming out of the parking lot after school, after I had dismissed our team, football team, 
And I get to the top of the parking lot, and here comes this car speeding down the road. And I knew who it was, because I can see his head out the window waving to his friends. And then he got next to me, and he saw me, and he freaked. I changed him. This girlfriend cheated on him. He came to his mom and he said, Mom, why did she do that? If she wanted to, why didn't she just break up? He couldn't understand. Of course, I took his car away the following week. His glass was full. The night before he took his life, he talked to a good friend of his and said, you're not going to see me anymore. The friend said, I'm going to send another friend tomorrow to pick you up. Don't do anything. I want you to come to school tomorrow. And left it at that. He got up, went down to his computer, and put to his friends, goodbye. Nobody saw it. Ten minutes later, he got in the car with his friend, went down the street, told his friend, stop the car, I'm getting out right now. He said, Patrick, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to Colorado. No one's ever going to see me again. He took his wallet out and gave his friend the fifty dollars. He said, Pat's gonna get in trouble. He said, I don't care. He says, give me the rope in the back of your car. So what are you gonna do with that? He says, I'm gonna pull my car out of the driveway so my mother doesn't hear me. Nothing made any sense. But he had already made his decision. He went across the street into the woods and he took his life that morning. I can't hear the tail end of what Pat is saying. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to be real clear, like, you know, to those of the second stairs, I really can't see them from here. But real quickly, um, we came here out of respect and love for our communities, right? And although we may come from a different part of this country, right, and many of us have origins outside of this country, we come here out of love and respect for young people. So I'm going to ask real quickly, if you're not interested in what it is, get to that point, we make decisions on a daily basis that put our lives at risk. You see, every single day, there are people in here that if I ask you, okay, how many people do you know that have taken your life? Chances are some of you wouldn't raise your hand. But if I told you how many of you know at least one person walking outside of this building with a ratchet, how many of you know somebody that's out there drug dealing? How many of you know something about somebody out there that you love, that you care about, that has taken life or has been the victim of violence? Chances are a lot of y'all will be able to connect. Now I'm going to tell you, when I was your age, I wasn't that smart. Yeah, I was smart in that. I could see those wheels already turning. I remember, I just found a report card when I was in the, set, when, when I was in the ninth grade. And all I looked at those comments, when I looked at those absences, all oh, low test scores, all oh, failing, all oh, not making, not coming to school regularly, this, that, and the third. Not a single one of those comments could talk about the issues that I was dealing with that related straight to what that story was. You see, fact of the matter is, some of you are making those connections, but you cannot tell me that there is not something going on among us and within our own minds. In terms of how do I play this role, how do I survive, for those of us that come from other countries and have been given this opportunity, you come to a different world and sometimes you feel alone. Sometimes we make more choices based upon how we feel. Now I understand that what I'm talking about can't connect to everybody. You see, that I had to lose not one friend, but a second friend within a year. And the third went to prison for 12 years of his life so that I could finally wake up, so that I could start acknowledging what was wrong in my life, so that I could start acknowledging what I got control over. You see, when we talk about forgiveness, the first thing I'm here to do is I'm here to ask for forgiveness. I'm here to ask for forgiveness on behalf of the adults that have possibly failed you. Yes, some of us didn't grow up in the best of circumstances. Many of us in here probably like me grew up with no fathers. Some of us actually grew up with no adult, no parent in our lives. Some of us were raised by our grandmothers, our aunts, our uncles. Others were raised by the state. Some of us hate going home. Some of us hate coming to school. And even in a building like this with so many people in it, we still feel alone because of everything we've been through. Thank you. that nearly took his life.
say thank you to uh, Coach Tiliso and Serge. I want to thank the administrators of Eastside for allowing us to come back into their building. I've been here many, many times, um, but it's always a pleasure. You guys have been sitting here for quite some time. I'm the last speaker. I won't take up too much uh, of your, uh, your time. You've been doing a great job. As you were told, my name is Hushim Gowder, and yes, I was shot in a, a gang-related shooting. However, what you didn't hear in the bio is that, yes, I was 15 uh, when this happened, but I was shot six times. I was hit once in the spine, the other the bullets went into the legs. The one that struck me in the spine is the one that caused me to be paralyzed from the waist down. Uh, something else that you didn't really hear in the story in that bio is that you know, what happened to me when I was a teenager is going to affect me forever. So I really hope that that's something that resonates with you, that, you know, what we do when we're teenagers, it does follow us for the rest of our lives, you know, whether it's good or whether it's bad. Uh, another thing that you didn't hear in that bio very quickly is that I wasn't born into a gang. I joined the gang when I was probably in the sixth or seventh grade. I was having some issues that I was dealing with at home. Kind of like the jury was just to be at least saying, you know, I was struggling with some stuff. And as opposed to me talking to somebody and, you know, saying what I was going through, I kind of was seeking that stuff in the street. I was looking for a father-like figure. And so I began to hang around with kids that were kind of making some poor decisions. And we were sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And uh, if I could rewind the hands of time, I would tell you that I wouldn't change any of it because we are not staying. In a really, really beautiful place. I'm here crying and I'm dying in the back of the stand when I feel like, yo, Ma, chill. Like, I just remember saying, Ma, be quiet. And all of a sudden, my soul goes up in my body and this EMS worker's like, I got it. And he's telling my mother, just keep yelling at him, keep yelling at him. And all of a sudden, has my mother not been in an ambulance to nag me, I doubt if I would have survived. And so they rushed me to the hospital. And then when I got to the emergency room, the doctors and nurses, they push, they take off the stretcher that you come in on the ambulance and they put you in the hospital. Then next thing you know, they start shoving tubes down my mouth and down my nose and they tie my arms down. And this black female doctor, she goes, baby, this is gonna hurt. And before I can say what's gonna hurt, next thing I know, she takes a scalpel and she cuts the side of my chest open. So, before we get started, let me give you guys a quick disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer, we must do an auction. So we must have an auction because, as some of you know, if you are, you are property owners, from year to year, people do have difficulties and may not be able to pay their taxes. So if people can't pay their taxes, the city still must rely on what we budget and what the tax, what the expected income is from the tax value. So we have to, you know, we have to be able to capture that money. And the way the city does it is go out to auction. So once a year, there's an auction. Correct, Madam Sharon? At least once a year. Yes, once a year. At least once a year, there is a tax auction. And right in here in the chambers, they'll come in and they auction off any taxes that are in um, default. So this here is a special assignment sale. It's a um, discounted assignment sale. So this is not the, the regular tax auction. This is the different tax auction. This auction, there's a list and there's two separate lists. One is 70, discounted at 75% and the second is discounted at 10%. So one you can capture for 25% of the full value of the of the, um, the delinquency and the other you can capture for 90% of the value. Now, the ones that are under 25% of the value list these have been on an auction list previously. So they've been on the auction list before, and for one reason or another, they may not have sold. So if the city isn't capable of selling these properties, and some may have been on the auction list multiple times, and they didn't, they didn't sell. So it's what, it leaves us in a deficit in our budget, budgeting process if we can't capture all of that money. So are there any questions so far? All right, cool. So. Um, the next step is, Mr. Mendez, how you doing, sir? The next step is, once we go into the, to the auction process, um, anyone is capable of coming to the forefront and bidding on, on, on these properties, on these tax 
assignment sale. So it's not, you're not bidding on the property. One thing I have to point out today, in fact, council president, in a regular tax sale, if I went to a normal tax sale and I purchased a tax lien, a tax sale certificate, there's a process that begins. Well, let me, let me look at it from the, put it at, to you at a, a different perspective, because I've personally been in this situation before. If my property is delinquent in taxes, and it's sold at a tax set. There's a two year period that I have before the purchaser of that tax certificate can begin the process of foreclosure. So this special assignment sale, the, the, what makes it different is that process may have already taken place because again, these are long, uh, taxes that may have came to a previous sale, and even though it didn't sell in the, in the um, and this I, I may need Madam Sharon to clear up, even though it may not have sold at a tax assignment, at a tax sale, the city still places it in the position where the two-year process now begins.